I have the pleasure of introducing our first keynote speaker, Terry Hill. Terry Hill has more than 28 years of professional experience working with rural healthcare providers and their communities. He is currently Executive Director of Rural Health Innovations and Founder and Senior Advisor to the National Rural Health Resource Center. In the past five years, Terry has facilitated six national summit meetings on various rural health topics, including health information technology, rural hospitals, quality leadership, performance improvement, and rural health networks. Currently, he serves as part of the adjunct faculty at both University of Minnesota Duluth Medical School and the College of St. Scholastica, where he teaches health policy and performance management, respectively. The long and short of it is that Terry really is a visionary for what rural health can be and has been one of our biggest supporters for this event. We're really lucky to have him kicking off this our weekend for us. So without further ado, Terry Hill, please, please give it a chance. Thank you very much, and it's really a pleasure to be here. This is a really exciting event. I've got about 15 minutes to kind of lay the groundwork for the American healthcare system, where it is right now, where it's going, and uh, how rural communities can kind of work together uh, to make the future more successful, let's say, than, than the past has been. Now, the, the main points here, let me see back up just a second. Okay. <laughs> okay. First of all, we, we have to understand that the U.S. healthcare system is undergoing dramatic change. This, this is not a mirage, this is not a, a political story, etc. We are moving very rapidly into an entirely different healthcare system. Uh, how do we know that? Uh, partially because we spent a lot of time talking with the Mayo Clinics of the world, the Cleveland Clinics, American Hospital Association, American Medical Association, National Rural Health Association, etc. It's pretty much a consensus that we are moving in this new direction. The new direction is going to be very, very different than the old uh, system. Uh, in essence, what we are coming from is a system where we paid for medical procedures and did not pay for, for wellness, did not pay for prevention, etc. We're going to move into a new system where this is going to happen. It is already happening. Um, the current Secretary of Health and Human Services is projecting that within three years, if by 2018, 85% of fee-for-service payments will change into this new value-based system. The road ahead for rural health care providers is going to be very challenging. Uh, we've always been challenged. Uh, we have fewer resources. Um, we, but we have a lot of things going for us, and I want to. I'm, I'm very much an optimist about this, both in, in terms of where the industry is going, and also in terms of what rural is going to emerge from uh, in this new system. Our rural healthcare providers and communities can lead the way in system reform, and I'm really pleased to see this hackathon being held here that we're actually working together as community leaders, as a variety of different healthcare providers to forge a new future. And we're gonna have to work together if we're going to create the value that we're going to need and to maximize the health of our communities. I mean, it's truly going to be about keeping people healthy, about providing value, and about finally kind of reconstructing the American health system. Now, this, this, this is a quote from Joseph Stalin. And I, I used it because I, I have something to say about both of the sides of this quote. One death is a tragedy, he said. One million deaths is a statistic. And in essence, millions of people died in Russia under Stalin's regime. And um, basically, because it was a statistic, he was pretty much able to get away with that. The tragedy, basically, I want to talk a bit about is my mother died just a few days ago, and her funeral was, was this week. And for me, that really was a tragedy. For my entire family, it was a tragedy as well. And during the course of the last dozen years or, or so, she has gone through the American healthcare system and has seen both the good and the bad. At the end, she was in an assisted living facility and had just an extraordinary team of professionals that worked with her, that loved her, that basically kissed her goodbye as she left them. Nine of them actually came up and told her that they loved her and kissed her. This was a rural assisted living facility 
This is what we have to offer. It's that personalized care. And my mom could have been taken care of any better anywhere else in the world. Uh, she also had a lot of experiences in the bigger hospitals in the Minneapolis area. And there were a lot of medical mistakes made. There was a lot going on. It was a tragedy for our, for our family in general. We've got to take this out of statistics. We've got to put it into your family, my family, et cetera. If, if you don't have one of these tragedies in your family, I, I hope you never have it. But in essence, we all have children. We all have mothers and fathers, et cetera. So for me, this is very personal. Okay. So a million figure. The, the projection is this is a very conservative figure. Even the American Medical Association would, would agree with this. Over a, a million people are, are hurt every, or killed every year by medical mistakes. That's the million uh, figure from, from Stalin's quote. It's from about, about adverse drug interactions. There's about a million of those that, that take place. Hospital-acquired infections, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of those inadequate care coordination, and finally, over-treatment. <laughs> the over-treatment, by the way, may, not, may seem rather benign, but when you really look at what that does, we find that the more treatment, the worse the outcomes. The more money spent, the worse the outcomes. I'll give you an example. Florida, the number one spender of, of, of uh, Medicare dollars, they, they're spending approximately twice as much per Medicare patient than some of our rural states. And so. What is, so if they're the number one spender, they are the number 50th in terms of quality. The number two spending state is number 49 in quality as well. We have a ton of over-treatment and we're gonna have to do something about it. Particularly stuff that is, that is done in, in uh, excessive medication, <coughs> excessive procedures, et cetera. Next. So what is the system that is based on volume brought us? It's brought us the highest cost in, in the world, over double in this, the next highest country. So for example, um, we are roughly double what, what they pay per capita in Canada, in England, in Japan, et cetera. So this is one of the primary reasons you think it would be enough that we have a system that doesn't really provide the care that the American people deserve. But in essence, it's very much about the cost at this particular point. Healthcare will bankrupt this country if we don't do something about it. The cost of chronic illness alone is now well over a, tr a trillion dollars. And the projection is we do nothing, that's going to go up to four trillion dollars by 1929. Something's got to be done from a cost standpoint. I'll also give you an example. If, if our wages continue as they are and healthcare inflation continues as they are, in essence, we would by, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, within 20 years, we're going to be paying 51% of our, of our wages for healthcare premiums. So every dollar spent, if, if the employer's not going to pay it, then we're going to be paying more and more of that as well. Lower quality, we rank 37th in the, uh, the, the world in terms of quality. I don't have to go into any, any greater detail. Um, this is not value and quality itself, despite the great efforts of the many, many healthcare providers are out there, uh, we simply have a dysfunctional system. Very high chronic illness as well. Uh, the, the, I have a statistic in terms of the we have a crisis just in terms of the mental health of our children. We've gone, uh, we've had a 3,500% increase, 3,500% increase in the last 20 years in the number of children who are now uh, basically classified as mentally ill under the, the SSI system. And diabetes is, is out of control, et cetera. And part of the, the reason has been we don't pay for chronic illness management. Low access, we've had, about, we've had about 50 million people that, that uh, uh, have not had insurance. And so this system, it deserves to go away. It, it is the, the people that work in it are, are, are victims as well. And I can tell you that I give this talk across the country and I get no pushback from anybody in terms of this. Next. 
So if the old system was based on value, the new on volume, the new system will be based on value. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the more the next slide. The new, new system is really focusing in, and I mean it sincerely, on better health, better care, and lower costs. And it's possible because we know lower costs is possible because even by the American Medical Association's own calculations, we are, we are basically wasting between one quarter and one third of all health care that's provided. Those are probably pretty conservative numbers. In other words, pure waste. So if we, if we diminish that waste, and there's tons of ways to do it, we're going to be able to lower that cost. The care being 37th in the world is nothing to be proud about. We certainly have room for improvement there. But the big thing is going to be about better health. And that's going to take a community effort. And that's why I hope you're all here at the Hackathon, because we can't do it all. In essence, 40% of the outcomes, health outcomes, has to do with, with lifestyles and personal choices on the part of people. 30% has to do with genetics. About 15% has to do with other factors that kind of that revolve around uh, the environment and about other things as well. And only about 10% of health outcomes are going to be determined by healthcare providers themselves or by the medical system. Next. So th there it is. Quality plus health over cost is, is what we're going to need in terms of this patient value. And the new uh, type of, of, um, of, of healthcare organization that is forming across the United States is called an accountable care organization. We already have over 600 of them. And um, by, we believe, by the end of this year and the beginning of next, we'll have over 1,000 as well. Now, there's not that many in rural areas, but there's no question about the fact that Medicaid is already moving very rapidly into this area. They're already talking about how much money that, that they've been saving in Oregon, in Minnesota, in Colorado, and such. And under this accountable care organization, we're going to get paid for the first time to keep people healthy and to manage chronic illness and to basically address some of our, our higher cost patients. Hospice is going to emerge. I could go on and on, but um, believe me, that, that whole uh, value statement is something that, that Mayo Clinic is using. Uh, again, everybody understands that's where it's going. And in essence, the challenge is going to be how are we as rural communities going to be able to survive in this new environment next. So we've got this image up there. We're going to have to go from the current system, where we are right now, how we're getting paid, into this new environment. And we've got to be very careful as we go across, because we're still partially under the old payment system. And we're moving into this new payment system moving forward. So here's the reason for optimism. Here's why rural communities do not have to be victims. We have a whole lot going for us in this value-based system. First of all, the new uh, revenue stream of the future, the new basic uh, value-based systems that are emerging are really built on primary care and primary care providers. Now, we have one primary care provider in this country for every four specialists while Canada has one primary care provider for, for every specialist, and, and most of the other countries do as well. We're going to see this shift gradually as we're moving forward. But we have, our, our health care systems in rural areas are built on primary care. We have low, lower beneficiary costs in rural. Uh, we have reimbursement advantages because of critical access, hospitals, et cetera. Rural can change quicker. We're smaller. We're more mobile. It's very, very difficult to change these great big systems. Now, and <coughs> surgery used to be a major revenue center. It is now going to become a major cost center. We don't have a whole lot of problems in that regard in contrast to some of these bigger systems. And rural is more community-based, and that's going to be a part of the success formulas. Go ahead. Now, this is the blueprint for value that we put together. This was done in collaboration with providers across the country, organizations, et cetera. We feel these are the most important pieces 
that need to be accomplished in rural areas. The top of the list is leadership alignment. And I'm not just talking about medical leaders or hospital leaders. I'm talking about community leaders, leaders of all the other different type of uh, healthcare uh, services, leaders pretty much in, in all of the rural communities as well. We're gonna have to create a vision and strategy that is gonna be motivating and, and, and if we can't translate this into how it's gonna help our kids and our parents, et cetera, then it's gonna be extremely difficult. We've gotta build that, that, that way to get across the shaky bridge. It's gonna be very important to have partnerships, care coordination, and very active community involvement. I don't have time to go into all of those, but it's going to mean actually reaching out to various types of healthcare services, uh, you know, mental health, schools, everybody else, they're gonna all have to work together here if we really wanna make an impact. There will be every motivation, I promise you, on the part of healthcare providers to include these kind of non-traditional healthcare entities. We've got to use data and information to make our decisions. Decisions It needs to be evidence-based. We need to have a, a change-ready and adaptable workforce. Working as teams now. Physicians will have a role, but what we're going to be seeing and already seeing across the United States are care coordination teams that are basically, basically uh, working and helping the patient from entry into the system the time they get into home, and then following up at home as well. We're gonna have to have uh, highly efficient, we're gonna have to take the fat out of the system. All the inefficiencies are gonna have to go as well. And we think that's gonna lead to excellent performance and success in that value-based system. Rural is going to do it. Uh, it's, it's the, the big question is, are they going to be willing to work together and do it in time? Yes. So my favorite uh, uh, cart slide of all time, that's how we're gonna do it, by working together. To me, that's the perfect thing for the hackathon. We need to spread innovation, and the only way we're gonna do that, is, as I said, is working together. Next. And if, if this is a quote from Will Rogers. Even if you're even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. We cannot afford to sit there. Those of you that showed up today are indication that, that you're willing to come and uh, participate in this very exciting event. So with that, I'm going to thank you very much, and we'll have our next speaker.